All right. Well, it's my uh, incredible privilege to welcome you all to the 2022 uh, Eason Weinman Lecture on International and Comparative Law. Uh, as far back as the 19th century, uh, Tulane's first president, William Preston Johnston, uh, hailed the science of comparative jurisprudence as the defining strength that made Tulane Law School unique among American law schools. Today, of course, uh, in the age of globalization, every law school claims to be a global law school uh, and claims that mantle. But Tulane staked its leadership on this ground 175 years ago, uh, at a time when few of these other law schools even existed. Uh, and in fact, uh, in 1847, uh, when this law school was founded, uh, the first two lectures given at Tulane uh, were one in admiralty law uh, and two in comparative law. Uh, so it is in our blood. Louisiana, with its uh, distinctive uh, civil law tradition uh, and surrounded by common law neighbors, uh, is of course always and has always been a natural laboratory uh, for the study of comparative law, but it required shrewd leadership uh, and uh, vision to exploit that uh, natural advantage uh, and to develop Tulane's preeminence uh, in the field of uh, comparative law, a field of growing academic and practical importance. Since 1981, uh, Tulane's leadership uh, in this field has been sustained through the Eason Weinman Center uh, for International and Comparative Law, established through the generosity of Ambassador John Giffen Weinman uh, of the Tulane Law Class of 1952 uh, and his wife, Virginia Eason Weinman. Ambassador Weinman built an extraordinary and distinguished career uh, on the international stage, first as a partner uh, for nearly 30 years with uh, New Orleans uh, uh, eminent Phelps Dunbar law firm, then as president of the Waverly Oil Corporation, and finally as U.S. ambassador to Finland uh, and the chief of protocol in the White House. Ambassador and Mrs. Weinman have each served uh, in important leadership roles in higher education. Uh, ambassador Weinman is chair of the Tulane University Board of Administrators, uh, and Mrs. Weinman as a trustee of her alma mater, Connecticut College. Uh, the impact of Ambassador and Mrs. Weinman's uh, loyalty to Tulane uh, and their vision of excellence can be seen uh, everywhere in the halls around us, uh, in the Eason Weinman Center, uh, in the Eason Weinman Chair, in the Eason Weinman Lecture, uh, and in, the, in our Tulane Center for Energy Law, uh, and of course, literally in the halls around us, uh, because we gather, of course, in the magnificent uh, Weinman Hall. Although Ambassador Weinman uh, passed away in 2016, uh, we continue to feel his presence very much at this lecture uh, and in so many other aspects of the law school. Uh, and we are tremendously honored to be joined uh, tonight uh, by Mrs. Weinman, uh, who continues to be a stalwart supporter of this lecture, of the center, and of the law school generally. All right, so I invite you, uh, please, to join with me in acknowledging and thanking uh, Mrs. Weinman and uh, her beloved husband, uh, Ambassador Weinman, for their uh, enormous generosity and support of this. Well, this lecture uh, is uh, always a monumental occasion uh, and really is uh, a, uh, a marquee event in the in intellectual life of this law school. Uh, it is doubly significant this year uh, because we are honored uh, to welcome as a speaker one of our own, uh, Professor Vernon Palmer, uh, who has played a singular role uh, in advancing Tulane's uh, global reputation in international and comparative law over the past more than 50 years as a member of our faculty. Uh, and who earlier this year was named by the International Academy of Comparative Law uh, as one of the world's five great comparatists. Uh, so we could not be more honored uh, to celebrate uh, this lecture uh, than to uh, welcome uh, our uh, colleague uh, Vernon uh, for this occasion. And with that, I will now turn the podium over uh, to uh, Professor Jörg Fetka, uh, co-director of the Eason Wyman Center uh, to uh, properly introduce Professor Palmer. Good 
Dave Meyer, Dave, many thanks for these uh, words. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, students, and guests, dear Vernon, I want, first of all, to extend a warm welcome to Virginia Wyman. I was hoping to have you with us tonight, uh, and these hopes have been heard. It is a special honor and a great pleasure to have you in Wyman Hall. The event would not be the same without you, and your husband is dearly missed this evening. Please allow me to make a, a personal remark here. We tend to remember people in flashes and short but often vivid bursts of memory through special moments or particular encounters. Here is how I will always remember the ambassador. On occasion of an Eason Wyman lecture over in the MPR during the reception, he was gracious to the speaker, friendly to the faculty, and respectful to the dean. But he quickly left the group, seeking out and finding students that had made their way to the event. He engaged them casually and put them at ease, and then showed great interest in their views, their perspectives, their responses to what had been presented that evening, in their hopes and expectations regarding the law, in their current studies at Tulane, and in their future careers. He crisscrossed the room and spoke with all of them, in groups or individually. It was a very deliberate move on his part that I then witnessed many more times on subsequent occasions. It was heartwarming to watch and stands, I believe, very much for what Tulane Law is about, genuine personal interest in this community and every member of it, non sibi sed suis. Thank you, Ambassador and Virginia Weinman, for all your efforts and contributions to the life of this school these past decades. Vernon Palmer II is very much a part of the bedrock that is Tulane Law. Let me draw your attention to the flyer that was distributed as you entered the lecture theater today. It displays the long list of speakers who have in past years given us the honor of offering their ideas and insights on international and comparative law to audience here in New Orleans and Louisiana. To pick but a few names, Sir Basil from England, Geoffrey Jowell from South Africa, Hein Kurtz from Germany, or the Honorable Nicholas Cassira, who was appointed a Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2019. All of them are world-class scholars and close colleagues. Quite a few of them are good friends. Tulane can, I think, be extremely proud of this list. Vernon, too, is a world-class scholar, a close colleague, and a good friend. Tulane can be very proud of him. He was the first of then many friendly faces that welcomed me to the school more than 15 years ago. Can you believe it, 15 years? He has been an office neighbor and dear colleague ever since. We are co-directors of the Eason Weinman Center for International and Comparative Law and comrade in arms in organizing so many endowed lectures that were not always free of organizational wrinkles. Some of you may recall a lecture canceled at short notice on a lovely autumn day for fear of dangerous ice and snow. A speaker ensnared by the ins and outs of complex COVID regulations, or before my time here at Tulane, the much more severe disruptions caused by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. It was at times stressful, but always great fun to face these and other crises with Vernon. Professor Palmer is also a teacher of the law with a renowned classroom's presence. I offer a summer program in Berlin each year, and many students come directly from the Tulane Paris Institute of European Legal Studies that Vernon organizes there. It is always his comparative class on the French legal culture that stands out when I ask them about their Paris experience. Most of all, however, Professor Palmer is a true scholar with a global intellectual reach. This is why I suggested to the Dean that we take the unusual step of inviting an active member of the faculty to offer tonight's lecture. Vernon's name belongs on this list of speakers. He can look back on a rich academic career full of significant research projects 
spanning legal traditions, comparative methodology, contracts, torts, and constitutional law, Roman law, legal history, and slavery. A long list of books and articles under his name is evidence of a continuous flow of legal ideas, insights, questions, a seemingly endless search for legal knowledge and solutions. Of his many academic positions and honors, I mention only a selected few. He is a member of the French Légion d'honneur in the rank of Chevalier, which indicates at least 25 years of professional activity with eminent merits. He has held visiting professorships at law schools across the globe, ranging from Martinique to Hamburg. He is president of the World Association of Mixed Jurist Jurisdiction Scholars, an elite group of colleagues interested in the unique features of legal systems that combine elements of civilian and common law. He is a member titulaire of the International Academy of Comparative Law, which honored him only last year as one of the great comparatists of our time, an exceptional distinction and recognition not only of his lifetime academic record and standing within the global community of comparative lawyers, but also of the institution that he has chosen as the epicenter of this formidable intellectual activity, Tulane Law School. He holds a law degree of Tulane Law and joined the school after stints in Indianapolis and, yes, Lesotho as an associate professor in 1970 and ascended to a full professorship five years later. He is Thomas Pickles Professor of Law since 1990. Just as Ambassador Weidman, Vernon is a true Tulanian with deep roots in our academic community. Professors, Professor Palmer's theme tonight could not be more topical. We live in extremely volatile times in which all areas of the law are affected by the now obvious consequences of climate change, by catastrophic events on a global scale triggered by an ever more interconnected and interdependent human race, and by military conflicts that have, as on only few occasions in the past, the potential to disrupt life and endanger even bare human existence in societies far removed from their immediate causes. Can key principles of law that have roots in very different times survive these troubled waters? Can they still balance adequately the interests of the parties, be it in torts, contracts, or public law, and secure just outcomes? Or must they be modified, rethought, or perhaps even exchanged by completely new approaches? Pacta non sunt servanda is such a fundamental of the law, and how hurricanes, pandemics, and other catastrophes affect that and, and interact with this principle of contract law is what Vernon will explore for us tonight. I much look forward to this comparative treatment of a very complex topic. I invite you to celebrate Ambassador and Virginia Weinman, sponsors of the series, and our most gracious supporters for so many years. The Eason Wyman Center, which has given international and comparative law a home at Tulane. This endowed lecture series, which has over the years contributed so many splashes of intellectual color to the life of the school. But most of all, our speaker tonight. Join me in welcoming Professor Vernon Palmer. Vernon, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Jörg, thank you for those very kind words. Someone sent you the wrong CV, apparently. <laughs> you almost succeeded in raising my reputation to the point of the same level as the, my predecessors at this lectern. Um, but I truly enjoyed your efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I've attended many excellent Eason Weinman lectures over the years. But usually I sat where you are sitting. 
And I was interested, just like you, to hear the words of wisdom from the distinguished lecturers. We have had great scholars, and Jörg mentioned a number of them coming from <clears throat> Hamburg, Paris, London, Berlin, India, South Africa. My travel expenses were somewhat less than theirs. I took an elevator down to be with you. My hotel expenses should be a lot less too. I plan to sleep in my own bed tonight. But the fact is that despite the fact that I'm a great bargain, this in no way can detract from the honor I'm receiving. This is the honor of my life. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Let me begin with this thought. <clears throat> that surprise plays an important part in comparative law. Sometimes when the comparative lawyer looks at his own system in light of other systems, he comes across maybe a strange word or a peculiar institution, an out of place element, an unfair result, adjusted position of ideas, something may seem inequitable. The comparativist may ask, <clears throat> how could that be true? Or how could this be true? Surprise may be the spark of curiosity and curiosity may lead to a discovery. Surprise can even lead, be the catalyst of an Eason Weinman lecture. Tonight, may I lead you on my own journey of surprise, for in this lecture, this frankly intimidating lecture, I've been carrying thoughts of force majeure, hurricanes, pandemics around with me for some time. I would like to share certain reflections with you. And if I may, I would like to dedicate this lecture to the memory of a great civilian and comparatist the late Professor Saul Litvinov of LSU, because he once struggled mightily to change minds and reform the very subject I'm going to be talking about. He did not succeed, but he recognized something anomalous and inequitable in our law. I did not discover his efforts until I was midway in the midst of writing up my notes for this evening. And thanks to my generous colleague, Ron Scalise, uh, I was able to, to obtain some documents documenting the efforts of Saul Litvinov. Therefore, I think it's fitting that what he tried to do 40 years ago, I am suggesting we ought to do tonight and tomorrow and the next day. Let me begin with what I consider to be an anomaly. Louisiana has codified in its civil code, one of the most absolute versions of the expression pacta sunt servanda that you can find in comparative law. This Latin phrase expresses in the most emphatic way that contracts must be obeyed. Some say this injunction has religious roots, as you can find in the Bible. The saying, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. We civil lawyers or civilians, we know the idea of pactus and sabanda is deeply enshrined in our civil code. It's embedded in a famously worded provision or declaration, which says that the contractual bond is the equivalent, has the equivalent force as legislation between the parties. A private contract, the way it's worded, is compared to the force of legislation. 
Professor Litvinoff expressed the degree to which contracts are binding in the following words. I won't read all of them, but he said, an obligor in that conception, meaning Pacta Sunt Savanta, must honor his signature or his word at any price. He is bound to employ all his efforts and resources and even face the collapse of his business if necessary in order to perform his obligation. His diligence, in other words, must be absolute and perfect, regardless of the magnitude of the increase in physical or financial effort that unforeseen events or changes in circumstances may require of him in order to perform. Well, that may be just enough to give the idea. Contracts must be obeyed. Louisiana has embraced this concept and taken it very far. It has left almost no room for excusing obligors from the severe difficulties and hardships arising from unforeseen dis disasters. In my view, and this is on a mythical scale, a mythical scale of rigorousness that I compiled, Louisiana may be ranked number one for its rigor, above English law, above American law, and even above French law as it now stands. Those legal systems are somewhat more flexible, less stringent, because they at least provide the obligor with wider, more flexible, and even multiple defenses in the face of force majeure. Louisiana, however, permits but one defense, the defense of true impossibility, which is so narrow that it is almost never satisfied. This unyielding rule strikes me as rather ironic, at least for the, the Louisiana I live in. Louisiana that is not known for rigor in almost anything. And this Louisiana has to be regarded as one of the world's capital, capitals of force majeure events, as shown by its recurrent subjection to hurricanes, epidemics, floods, and other disasters that repeatedly interfere with the ability of obligors to perform their contractual promises. <laughs> I have read that up to 160 recorded hurricanes have, have struck Louisiana. And that's a severe undercount, count, I think, because many more occurred before they were recording them. Certainly, we're very familiar with uh, disease and epidemics. Long before this city was called, this has been forgotten, but long before it was called the Big Easy, it carried the frightening title of City of the Dead, Necropolis of the South. These are all expressions found in the newspapers of the 19th century. Due to the frequent almost yearly yellow fever epidemics that broke out here in the summer months of the 19th century. So the curious anomaly that I begin with, my point of departure, is that our civil code our most revered document calls for the near absolute sanctity of contracts to be observed in a part of the world that is a veritable vortex of force majeure. Now, this is not, this is not a, uh, a legal class tonight, but I just put on the, uh, on the left-hand side that for, for force majeure to apply as a defense, as what we call the impossibility defense, true impossibility, five preconditions must be met. Five preconditions, all of them must be met. Can't leave one out. First, you need what is called a fortuitous event. Secondly, the, the performance must become truly impossible. Third, the event was not reasonably foreseen at the time of the contract. Fourth, the risk of this occurrence was not assumed by the obligor. 
he didn't take it upon himself, this risk. And number five, the obligor at this point is neither at fault or in default. So just bear that in mind for a moment. Now, all I want to do now is to give you two examples of this anomaly in action. Well, I'll start by saying, actually, the first storm that ever hit uh, New Orleans was in 1722, four years after the city was founded. And it demolished all the primitive huts that had been built up to that point in four years. Apparently, <clears throat> I've read that everyone wanted to go home somewhere else. This didn't look favorable. And they probably would have done so, but there were no boats to leave in. And so they had no choice. They started rebuilding again. This was the first, but not the last time that the city has been saved for a negative reason. A far more significant. No. A far more significant storm arrived in 1856 and tore in half to Last Island, which was the Great Barrier Island towards the mouth of the Mississippi River, 26 miles in length then. Last Island was a resort, was a resort where wealthy planters and vacationers went to enjoy the sea and the casino that was at the luxury hotel. And as described by Lafcadio Hearn in his memoir of Last Island, when this powerful storm tore Ile Dernière in half, the water and the wind broke into the hotel ballroom even as the orchestra played and the patrons were still dancing. 200 people drowned that night. The gaiety turned quickly into shrieks and cries of sauve qui peut. Now, as Lafcadio describes the, the day before and the day after, it was calm the day before and it was calm the day after. <coughs> In that era, there were no advance warnings in newspapers. There was obviously no radio or television alerts. There were no calls for evacuation ever made. We're at least a hundred years before the use of radar, reconnaissance planes, and sophisticated weather models. It was even before the concept of a hurricane season had been formulated or developed. That didn't take place until the 1930s, the hurricane season that we rely on these days. So this was definitely a force majeure uh, event, yet under our civil code, which was then no different than it is today, Louisiana law would not have excused contractual obligations unless they had become absolutely impossible. Now, this brings me to the case of Adam Sickinger in 1915. The great hurricane of 1915, unnamed, but all hurricanes up until the 1930s were unnamed. The New Orleans School Board wanted to build a new school, and they had acquired all the land they needed in a square except for Mr. Sickinger's house on a, on a plot. It sat. So the school board said to him, we'll make a deal. We'll move your house across the street onto just directly across the street onto another lot, which we will convey to you. And you convey your lot to us. And now everything is perfect. This agreement was reached in May of 1915. And it's important to note the month. The work was to be done in 60 days, within 60 days. 
But that didn't happen. It wasn't started until September 21st, which, as you know, is deep into the hurricane season. After seven days of work, they had managed to move the house across the street, I guess, on rollers. It, the, the, the court decision doesn't go into the actual method, but they had gotten it across the street and they'd put on some elevated supports and jack screws. At that point, the hurricane hit and tore the house apart. Mr. Sickinger said, you've got to build my house back where it, like it was. You've got to make me whole. School board said, force majeure, it's impossible to do that. The lower courts held in favor of the school board's plea of impossibility, but the Supreme Court reversed. It held that the defense of impossibility could not apply here because two preconditions had not been met. The first precondition was that a party in default is not released when it has assumed the risk of the fortuitous event. The school board had put a clause in the contract saying, uh, we guarantee that we will repair all damage to the house in, during the moving. And the court inferred from that that they had assumed the risk of a hurricane. The second precondition that had not met, and it was more definitive for the court, was that the damage caused by the hurricane had not made moving the house impossible. It only made it more expensive. The contract didn't stipulate how the house was to be moved, so the court speculated there were two ways you could have moved this. You could have moved it in whole, as a whole intact across the street, which apparently they attempted to do and had succeeded up to a point. But the court said, and it was just theorizing, they might have dismantled the house altogether on this side of the street and then carried the parts over to this side of the street, the other side of the street, you could have dismantled it and then reassembled it to construction jobs. And therefore, if you could have done that, it was possible. And the defense of impossibility could not stand. The court did not attempt to measure the extra time and extraordinary expense this might have entailed. Didn't even mention it. Ignoring all of that, the Supreme Court simply declared it was, quote, it was the duty of a school board to reconstruct the building after the storm using what material was yet suitable and substituting like material for what it was destroyed. It seems then that all conditions of the five I've mentioned have to be met. Reconstruction of a building out of its scattered parts? That sounds onerous, excessively expensive, but those considerations are not in play. They are irrelevant under Louisiana law. If the board, if the school board could physically or have physically built, rebuilt Sickinger's home, it was its duty to do so. In other states, in our surrounding states, this might have been labeled impractical or impracticable because they use this some, somewhat softened impossibility, uh, substituting for impossibility, something softened called the test is impracticability. This is found in the Uniform Commercial Code. It's also found in our restatement second of contract, which applies to all kinds of contracts and is pretty much followed in so many states. This more supple notion takes into account the difficulty of performing. Something may be impracticable because it's difficult to do and expensive to carry out. Professor Litvinoff was well aware of this 
second signature decision that I'm just now talking about, moving the house. He was well aware of it. This is the one one decision that caught his eye, I think, particularly. He regarded it as a, as a harsh outcome. Therefore, he attempted in 1981, the, the date of the founding of the Eastern Weinman Center, he attempted in 1981 to introduce impracticability in place of absolute impossibility before the Council of the Law Institute, but the council did not agree. He next attempted to have the council consider another theory called imprévision, which at, the, which at the time was available in most countries of Europe, save France. He laid before the council a string of code provisions taken from the Italian, the Greek, the Polish, the Quebec, and the Argentinian, his home country, Argentinian codes. And he asked the Institute for their approval to codify the doctrine of imprévision in the upcoming 1984 revision of the law of obligations in Louisiana. He wrote the following, that if the flexible definition of impossibility, which was impracticability, if the flexible definition does not meet with the council's approval, the reporter insists, the reporter insists that some provisions are necessary for the solution of situations where extraordinary circumstances, though not presenting a classical case of force majeure, make the performance of a contract unreasonably difficult for one of the parties. His insistence was to no avail. Let me come to a second and final illustration of the anomaly in action. Hurricane Betsy, it caused historic damage and flooding. Only two weeks before the storm arrived, on my birthday in, 19, in 1965, um, only two weeks before Mr. Schenck had signed an agreement with a construction company to add an addition onto his existing home. An amenity of some kind was to be added, maybe an additional room, uh, a bathroom, I'm not sure. The storm arrived and heavily damaged Mr. Shank's home and flooded it with six feet of water. Despite this damage, however, the remaining structure was deemed sound enough that it would have theoretically supported the contemplated addition that he had just agreed with the Capri construction company to erect. The company wanted to perform its part and be paid for it. But Shank sought cancellation of the contract, pleading that Hurricane Betsy was a fortuitous event that made it impossible to, for him to pay for the new addition. He could, he argued, he, I cannot pay for the new addition and at the same time pay for repairing my flooded home and replace all my lost possessions. Paying for all three things at once is just impossible. The court ruled, of course, that's not impossible. That's just a case of economic, quote unquote, infeasibility. An, oblig an obligor is not released by the mere fact that his performance has become more difficult or more burdensome due to a fortuitous event. Indeed, if I extrapolate a little bit further, the court didn't say this, but this is what seems to me to be happening. If you have a money obligation, as Mr. Shank had to pay for an addition, all money obligations are possible regardless of your personal circumstances, subjective impossibility is not counted. But note, this defense only looks at one obligation, the obligors. It doesn't look at what 
the counterperformance, if it has become valueless to the obligor, the counterperformance of the construction company, Schenck was unable to argue, as he could have under American law pretty much everywhere, that his whole purpose in having an addition built to his home was frustrated by this fortuitous event. Because now the new addition was completely valueless to him. After all, what value would a shiny, new, perfectly constructed addition be in perfect condition, but attached to a structure in uninhabitable condition? But Louisiana law cannot look at it that way. And only say he could have paid the money if he'd gone borrowing or if he had credit or if if he, a rich uncle died, he could have found the money. It's possible. It doesn't recognize the related defense of frustration of purpose. I hope in these two cases to show you the anomaly in action. There are many more cases. But Louisiana's notion of uh, impossibility is actually narrower than I have thus far suggested. I must add two glosses that the courts have added to the code. Five conditions? No, there's more. One judicial addition, addition, one judicial gloss recognizes the notion of temporary impossibility, whereby the duty to perform is only temporarily suspended and the debtor is not discharged. The moment the impediment ceases, the debtor must resume performing, no matter if the time frame for the contract has been thrown off entirely. A second gloss recognizes that the obligor must pursue available alternative means of performing. Supposing the impediment uh, prevents him from performing in the usual or the contemplated way, he must seek alternative ways of performing. Now, let me discuss for a moment some historical background, how we got here. And that is, we got here because of the French connection between Louisiana and France. Louisiana's strict notions are obviously not the result of geography, but are the result of legal history. Our present law is inherited. Maybe it started in Rome, but it came through France to us. As everyone knows, French law was implanted in Louisiana in the early 18th century at the founding of the colony. And then French law was further entrenched in greater detail in the 19th century by the nearly word for word reception of the Code Napoleon here. Our Code of 1808 in Louisiana marked the first reception of the Code Napoleon outside of France. And our code called the Digest of Orleans was the first European code anywhere in the Americas. And it was then that we acquired the basic structure of today's law, today's impossibility defense, which has not basically changed in the course of two centuries. That legacy and tradition, we've always been proud of it, but it's very difficult to change when you have affection in one direction and past dependency backing it up. Over those same two centuries, France herself maintained the most stringent version of Pacta Sunt Savanda in Europe. The French High Court, the, the Cour de Cassation, refused to re revise the terms of private contracts and would not release obligors because of extreme hardship. It rejected the theory of imprevision, even though the French Administrative High Court had accepted it. In a famous um, decision in the 19th century, the High Court settled that a contract could never be revised or renegotiated 
by judges, uh, even though it has become extremely burdensome and inequitable. Let me, let me tell you a little bit more about this famous decision. There's an obscure little waterway in Southern France. It's a narrow irrigation canal, which the engineer Adam de Crapon constructed in the year 1567. I'm informed by reliable sources that this little canal is so well known to French law students that even those who can't name all of the rivers in France can give you the canal's location, why it was built, why it's famous. And this is indeed a famous case. Here's why. When Adam constructed this irrigation canal, the inhabitants of the surrounding area contributed to the cost and agreed to pay him three sous or sol, sous, three sous for, for every two hectare that were irrigated. Over the course of three centuries, the value of this currency, which went out of existence actually, became derisory, depreciation, depreciated, virtually worthless. So finally, one sou equals five cents maybe, somewhere in the neighborhood of five cents. While Adam and his heirs the, the cost of maintaining this canal uh, continued to mount. And the uh, internal equilibrium of this contract uh, became very disproportionate. Finally, in 1876, the heirs of Adam went to court and asked for a revision of the contract. Their plea for increased compensation succeeded in the lower courts, but the Cour de Cassation, the High Court, quashed the judgment, stating the following. It is no part of the function of courts, however equitable it may seem to them, to modify the parties' agreements in the light of changing times and circumstances, or to substitute new terms in the place of those freely accepted by the parties. So in those lofty words, the High Court was proclaiming its attachment to the doctrine of pacta sunt sabanda, drawing its inspiration from the famous article 1134 of the Civil Code, which, as I mentioned a moment ago, compares the contractual bond to legislation. The court flat, flatly rejected the so-called theory of imprevision and its un, underlying rationale of rebus sic stantibus, which excuses performance when a contract becomes unduly burdensome. Today in France, however, there has been a change. During recent reforms in 2016, six years ago, France liberalized its position and added the defense of imprevision to the Code Civil. This now permits an obligor in circumstances of supervening hardship to request from the other party the renegotiation of the contract, or if that fails, to permit the parties to agree to dissolve the contract. Or, if that fails too, as a last resort, to ask a judge to draw up a fair contract. This remedy was already recognized across Europe and beyond Europe. And therefore, France belatedly joined the mainstream. But this left Louisiana conspicuously isolated. Now we are number one, and more than ever in need of reform. In regard to reform, it's important to know, it's important to know something about a difference between civil law and common law. In the civil law tradition, you have had a principle of impossibility from the beginning from the Roman days. At least as it's understood in France, this conception of force majeure connotes a transcendental force, 
external, unavoidable, and unpredictable, uncontrollable, usually exemplified by violent storms, eruptions, quakes, tidal waves, tempests, though it also recognizes that human acts and legal forces can obstruct performance, such as wars, terrorist acts, and the commands of government, uh, the, the act of the prince. French civilians use the expression force majeure as a shorthand and a synonym for this kind of impossibility, transcendental force. Louisiana uses the term fortuitous event in the same way as a synonym for this kind of impossibility. The common law, on the other hand, started from the opposite direction. It neither received nor recognized the principle of impossibility found in, Justinian, in Justinian's digest. English law developed separately on the other side of the channel, and it was never a province of the so-called jus commune of the continent. It actually started from the opposite position that a promise to do the impossible is valid. And breach of such an agreement gives rise to liability. Chief Justice Holt said three centuries ago that when a man will, for a valuable consideration, undertake to do an impossible thing, though it cannot be performed, yet he shall answer in damages. Sir Gunter Treitel, the late Sir Gunter, confirms that no theory of impossibility ever existed in English law, and that all assertions to the contrary have been repeatedly rejected. Nevertheless, here's something very puzzling. For we immediately find cases where the English courts say there's no obligation because it's impossible. But they term impossible in their usage means something different. It refers to a different sort of impossibility, I think. It does not necessarily derive from any transcendental superior force. Although it might include that, it doesn't start there. It may be merely some mundane occurrence that prevents the agreed performance. Some English commentators have no idea how much their statements puzzle their continental readers. They say, on the one hand, the common law does not recognize force majeure, Yet in the next sentence, the learned authors state that impossibility is a defense at common law, and they outline no less than three different forms that impossibility may take. I'm not going to go through the forms that they do, but uh, that they mention. But the English version of impossibility is, is not necessarily triggered by metaphysical impediments. The English notion results from scrutiny of the agreement, it results sometimes from implied conditions added to the agreement. It is sometimes a minute dissection of the performance called for by the contract. In other words, it is a search inside the contract for reasons to cast the risk of non-performance on one party or the other. For example, if the contract calls for the seller to sell at a fixed price, and that price due to changes in the market accelerates uh, uh, very high, then it is deduced from that that the seller, uh, under a fixed price, he took the risk that the cost of the product could suddenly rise due to supervening events. If the contract calls for the sh a shipment of goods to go through the Suez Canal, through a particular waterway such as the Suez, but that waterway is closed by government action or decree, the performance is impossible, but only because the contract made it so, since there are alternative routes around Suez, more expensive, but alternative. This contract approach, 
as I call it, is an analysis that excuses performance even when it could be performed by others, even when the impediment is not irresistible, exterior, and unavoidable. Performance becomes impossible when any impediment defeats the exact promise that was made. Impossibility, however, as a French legal conception, is not rooted in the contract. It deals in irresistible externalities. It connotes a promisor overpowered by the forces of the physical world or the commands of Leviathan. It is highly objective. It requires that anybody's performance under such circumstances would be impossible. Here then are two radically different conceptions of impossibility lurking within the same English word. Somewhat like two ships of the same name, gliding past each other in the night, headed in different directions. Yet oddly enough, though proceeding in different directions, they produce convergent results. Let me turn to just, as I near the end this evening, I'd, I'd like to briefly try to imagine the shape and structure of a reformed Louisiana law of force majeure and changed circumstances. First of all, I think we need both defenses, but with certain changes to each of them. The defense of impossibility should no longer require a finding of true impossibility. The code should replace that narrow and near absolute requirement with the more supple and pragmatic concept of impracticability, which American law developed and which has long been accepted in the Uniform Commercial Code and the Restatement Second of Contract. This idea of impracticability is a well-tested idea and can take into account the extreme hardships, including financial burdens caused by supervening events. There's no suggestion I know of that this more flexible approach is a threat to the security and stability of transactions. Professor Litvinov was in favor of widening and softening the defense in this way. And I trust it's no objection to this, that it grew out of the experience of our sister states. It's just no need for xenophobic fear of common law ideas here. Van Yering told us long ago that the reception of foreign legal institutions is not a matter of nationality, but of, use, but of usefulness and need. Only a fool would refuse a quinine because it didn't grow in his back garden, he said. <laughs> Secondly, we should also adopt the defense of change circumstances called imprevision, together with its rationale of excessive onerosity, but in doing so, we should avoid one feature of the French model as it exists today. That feature we should avoid is requiring the parties to attempt to renegotiate their contract. And additionally, that during that attempt, the obligor must continue to perform the alleged onerous contract. In my opinion, to require renegotiation is unnecessarily complicated and sure to be lengthy. And in the end, will be unfair to the obligor. Furthermore, the requirement of renegotiation is in any event unenforceable by the courts because it is not considered in bad faith to fail to re renegotiate a contract you negotiated at first in good faith. We should instead stay with the approach of our code and the approach of English and American law, which is that where a, def where a defense is made out and recognized by the court, it leads to immediate discharge of the contract by operation of law. This result I think is better because it's swift, efficient, and fair. I have some other uh, recommendations, but I see that the hour has absolutely, uh, and I'm holding you a little too long. I'm going to pre a few further ideas 
for reform and come to my conclusion. Let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying I'm not so vain or foolish as to think that any recommendations from me would change the mindset of the Louisiana legislator. History already shows how very hard it is to relax the grip, even slightly, of Pacta Sunt Servanda. Our code provisions on force majeure are very old. They have gone unchanged for several centuries, persevering through calamities like the First World War, the Second World War, the Civil War, hurricanes without names, hurricanes with names, yellow fever epidemics on an annual basis, the great influenza of 1918, and now the pandemic of 2020 to 2022 and continuing. These tenacious old provisions have also withstood the reform efforts of talent, talented code revisers like Professor Saul Litvinov. And if he did not succeed in changing them, then I do not see why I should be sanguine. Comparative law can suggest alternatives and reforms, but in the final analysis, any change of this venerable principle appears to involve a political decision, not just a legal decision. In the past, I've been a critic of the process of revising the Louisiana Civil Code under the stewardship of the Louisiana Law Institute. But at the same time, I've always been a supporter of the Institute's goals. Law reform is laborious and difficult and time consuming and oftentimes thankless. I know that in the process of legal reform, there are many rejected essays and drafts, many unknown redactors, many anonymous, anonymous and forgotten individuals who have toiled for the cause, their work hidden behind the scenes. Indeed, I know this lesson so well that in a 1992 essay celebrating the Quebec codification, which had just come out, and which I entitled Celebrating the Quebec Achievement, I wrote somewhat tongue in cheek, but I wrote the following words. Perhaps someday, someone shall propose that on a public thoroughfare in New Orleans or Montreal, a, a large tomb dedicated to the unknown redactor could be built to honor all who have labored anonymously in the cause of codification. And indeed, this proposal would probably pick up considerable political support if the critics of code revision would volunteer to build it or to be buried within. <laughs> By the way, I thought Tulane Avenue would be <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in all humility, I certainly hope that that figurative and facetious tomb will not be the final destination of the reform that I've suggested to you tonight. Thank you. asks, uh, will we have any questions and answers if they want? I'm sure you agree. So please. Marcus Puder from Loyola. Why are some civil codes so reluctant to embrace the words force majeure? Uh, I noticed that in- Because it's old, French. <laughs> I noticed in the old country, which is Germany, they use the two avenues, impossibility, and uh, Klausla, Legos Klausla. Um, so to look at the adaptation of the contract, whereas impossibility would, under the old Roman approach, have meant nullity, non existence. In the modern read of uh, the German civil law, there is still the possibility of liability for damages hanging around. Now, the counter approach is taken by the other soccer power. Since we talked about Argentina, <laughs> that is uh, that is Brazil, and in Brazil they use the two terms interchangeably: fortuitous event 
and force majeure. And then they define it as something that is unavoidable, unpredictable. Then the jurisprudence has gone and said, okay, force majeure is mother nature, your storm, your lightning, whereas the fortuitous event is the striving, the war. So they have been very explicit in their general law of obligation. Germany has not, yet the term does appear in, in the civil code sprinkled throughout, for example, it is a suspension ground for the running of prescription. It's in the law of travel. It's in the law of innkeeper. But yet in the general portion of obligations law, there's nothing like uh, intimating this, uh, this term. Sure. <clears throat> and then my last observation would be, <laughs> in practice, don't companies use their private autonomy to contract out? of this very strict uh, regime that you so splendidly described, Professor Collins? Well, addressing that last point first, yes, they do. Sophisticated uh, lawyer-advised contracts between business to business often do, especially in the common law tradition, that, who, where it's a necessity because they take the contract approach. Yes, they do, but I was not thinking, you notice that the cases I brought out, just a couple of cases, those are not, those were con like, like consumer contracts almost, or between a homeowner and a company, this is not the type of tra transaction you're just describing, where force majeure clauses, or maybe an admiralty in, in, in international business transactions, we find them quite frequently. Um, and they are very detailed, and they are construed narrowly by courts. And if you do not include the specific peril that you want to av avoid liability for, or, or if you do not include it, they may say, aha, even though you have some general clause saying all uncontrollable events are catch all at the end, they may say you didn't name it, therefore you're still liable. Um, your point about so I, I'm not really addressing those kinds of, I didn't bring up force majeure clauses because um, that's not something that the civil code uh, wants to control, needs to control. Uh, it's there, it's available if it's that type of transaction. Oftentimes the people I'm concerned about are, <clears throat> if they are signing an agreement that has a force majeure clause, it's not their force majeure clause, it's excusing the other side. And they aren't in any position to change anything because there's such inequality of bargaining power between the uh, two parties. That's frequently the case. So as you, you mentioned a distinction between fortuitous and force majeure. In Louisiana, between those two, they, they, they calmly chose fortuitous uh, knowing that that's the same as force majeure. Both are shorthand for this impossibility defense called true impossibility. And if that's the case, as you say, in Brazil, if that's the case in Brazil, uh, that there's some distinction between the two? Jurisprudential. A jurisprudential in, distinction. In the code, it's like a couple, happy couple. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. So, Oliver, Oliver, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm a layman to the civil court uh, law, but it seems to me that the reason for the hesitancy is the concept of civil law that it's all written down, therefore a judge has no right to move it, and the concept of the common law is exactly the opposite. And the civil law was created the whimsicality of the, of the common law, and the common law was afraid of the strictness of the of the other, but that's true in, in it's true in criminal law, it's true in so many things that uh, I just love the comparison. I never considered in this uh, light, I just considered in others. It's very enriching. Thanks, Claude. Brennan, you were a wonderful talk. Thank you, Brennan. Um, you began by saying there's some irony 
is the fact that Louisiana would be the site of so many disasters and so many surprises. And yet, paradoxically, at the same time, we have a legal regime that rigidly resisted that. And when I heard you say that, I thought, as a common lawyer, common law lawyer, why might it not be entirely consistent if a society is plagued by these very unpredictable and frequent disasters to react with the legal regime going, if we don't have this barrier, then there will be a, a crisis and we need to be rigid. And I realize that's just a wild generalization. So I was wondering what you thought of that. I think it's the wrong law for this latitude. <laughs> I think that it doesn't fit our circumstances. Um, <clears throat> a great financial center like London, a great financial center like New York, I find that they have very strict, the judges uh, want to uphold all contracts uh, and they want tremendous certainty. But I don't see that here, very frankly. I think that this, um, uh, I'm ranking this above the, uh, above New York and uh, and London in their strictness. They they want it absolutely certain, and we have it in a black and white fashion. That it's either five conditions, all of them must be met, uh, and how rarely that happens. Can, can I ask? Would would New Orleans exist without that doctrine, or would you know? We have, without keeping things together rigidly, you contract, you do it, you build the house, you build the you know, superstructure, whatever it is. You can't just walk away from this because otherwise, this is just a fun question. People would have walked away from New Orleans 100 years ago. Well, how come they're not walking away from Paris? <laughs> because well, they, 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 they've changed recently yeah, yeah. why 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 isn't there something but, but two observations Paris has a, a large you know kind of pin terminal it's 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 Orleans is isolated take the i-10 from the north and you'll see an island yeah it truly is an island i stopped once on the side of the ten because i had to take this photo of, of, of these skyscrapers in the water so where do you go you have to keep things together in paris there may be more flexibility <laughs> <laughs> So there's yeah. this, I, uh, you're seeing a symbiotic relationship between, between, this, all, between uh, this defense yes. and these islands. Yes, it's a thought came when I listened to <laughs> the island. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's, let's be more serious. Hans Dager, Hans Dager, a German comparatist, drew strong connection between the environment, the yes. race system, yes. You know, the environmental features that's the law and so did Montesquieu there you go so but, maybe but I but, but I'm saying that our strictness has nothing to do with our environment or <laughs> that we tried to fashion this device this law to fit this context to fit our climate that uh, we're at 30 30 longitude not a had nothing to do with it if if we had uh, legislators who were concerned about the environment and said, this is for us, and they made this tailor-made for us, I'd say, but this is really, and many Francophiles here in this room, with all due respect, I'm one too, but we have been maybe over solicitously following France in this regard, and now, we could be more alert to our needs here uh, in Louisiana. May I follow up? Yes. Question. You speak of latitudes. I'm afraid latitudes and what we associate with them, weather, temperature, whatever, everything is becoming very mixed up. We have, we have tornadoes in Hamburg, which used not to be the case. Correct. The tornadoes were not. Thing we there was a hurricane in Portugal. Hurricanes in Portugal. Things are, are getting out of control. Right. Latitudes are not the right measure anymore, perhaps, for some of the things that we used to uh, you know, associate with. My question is, in light of these increasing threats, uh, in, in light of things that are very, very unpredictable, do we need more 
or less flexibility. We need to keep things in place because people now can inform themselves and they know hurricanes can come up in Portugal and, and tornadoes in Hamburg. It's not it's not unforeseeable. Read the news. It's, it's going yes. to it's going to affect the foreseeability question. It is a great deal. But now the question, my question is more flexibility or less. That science is finally uh, it's a moving flexibility. Foreseeability is a moving mm -hmm. concept with science. Mm -hmm. The now we predict how many hurricanes are coming uh, each other, and they're fairly accurate on that. Now they're able to predict earthquakes. Fairly accurate. Um, what's unforeseeable yesterday? Let's say a hurricane, a hurricane in Connecticut. There was one, uh, Henri. Do you remember that one? In Connecticut, to hurricanes in Portugal. Whether you've had a tornado in Hamburg. Okay, but science. Someone died actually. Incredible. In one of these construction cranes it was the only victim. The construction crane. In, in, in the port of Hamburg, toppled down because of this tornado. One victim did. Incredible. So I think that the uh, <clears throat> keeping your eye on what science is providing is very important to the foreseeability question. The thing is, foreseeability is such a plastic word that, or unforeseeability, is also very plastic. If you haven't ever had the experience, we know it's unforeseeable. Is in even four or five generations back, they've never seen it. Those first those first colonists in 1722 experiencing a hurricane, I think, fit that category of, of, of having no idea what was going to happen to them the day before and then the day after. That fits. But now, hurricane season, uh, still, I maintain this as a difference in attitude between common law and civil law on on those force majeure. I don't find those clauses in our form contracts for ordinary real estate uh, transactions. I don't find them in there at all. I don't find them in, in rental agreements, um, residential leases, for example. Um, in other words, we don't have the habit, even though we have the havoc, we don't have the habit. <laughs> Well, Merton, do you, it might be a part of your talk you didn't get to, but do you think COVID will change anything? And the reason I ask that is because a lot of the cases, the old cases, involve natural disasters, and certainly COVID is in many ways a natural disaster, but one, one perhaps different aspect of it is there were also government orders involved, which is unlike a lot of the previous instances we've had. And there have been a couple of cases that have crippled their way up to the courts of appeal at this point, claiming contract couldn't be performed because the governor ordered businesses closed, or the mayor, right, had a decree in place which wouldn't allow us to perform. And courts have at this point found clever ways to say, we're going to avoid that issue. And I'm just, it's going to come back up, obviously. And I'm wondering if the governmental action aspect of it that absolutely precludes someone from that makes that makes that makes COVID a lot different. It is such an overwhelming go governmental response. And from the foreseeability standpoint, we know of epidemics. 1918 was a, a pandemic. Uh, the the Court of Cassation has said, well, it was foreseeable to have um, uh, Ebola because, the, and and therefore that isn't. Um, it was foreseeable. We'd had the cases before, and uh, so it's 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 not uh, impossible for you to you should have foreseen. It. But on the other hand, it's argued that in the case of COVID, the big difference is that it is a, an overwhelming response that you might not have ever anticipated. That's a different level. It's not the COVID itself; it's the response to it that is the major event that you couldn't that you didn't foresee I, I there's one author who goes on for seven pages to tell you that uh, <clears throat> to tell you that COVID is was foreseen there was an office in the national security uh, that was established uh, during the Obama years but it was dismantled by the next president 
well, um, he goes on, all, lists all those kinds of things. You had an office uh, for infectious diseases and for communicable diseases established within the White House. And you, so the evidence, I'd say 30 or 40 different uh, things you could have latched on to to foresee that uh, this was coming. Oh. Professor Palmer, would you care to comment on the possibility of the Mississippi River flooding, changing of directions, rising and falling in light of your force majeure doctrine, since that's been around long before the Corps of Engineers? And long before the taking of fresh water out of the Mississippi into the sewage and water board system, could you comment on the river and it being considered a possible force majeure situation? It certainly is, and it has occurred, but we don't expect it to. I mean, uh, however, an earlier comment by Mark Tudor that could be brought in here. If you look in the individual contracts, there are rules that would excuse a, less, a lessee from paying any rent if his field had been lost due to a change in the course of the river. That's the, in the law of leasing. It's like a force majeure article, but it doesn't explain why it's lost, the thing. It doesn't explain that. It just states if the thing is lost, you pay no rent, and the contract is at an end. But no, the, we don't expect the, uh, the river to change course, uh, even though it has in the past. And it is, I think, an unforeseeable event. Um, Katrina was labeled by uh, uh, Judge Fallon um, as he could not say that Katrina, though we have a season for these hurricanes, he could not say that Katrina was uh, not force majeure because the levee broke. That's what made Katrina different. Without that, it was just another storm. But so there's always a way to argue, depending on the consequences of the storm or the government's response to it, to COVID, it's always a way to argue that uh, this is different and this is not foreseen. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many ways to celebrate. We have a second way to celebrate. I invite you all to have some refreshments and continue our discussion. Renata, you.